Okay, so thank you very much um, for inviting me. I'm uh, really honored to be able to speak with you and share a little bit about what we're doing in terms of uh, trying to build a community and some awareness around ocean acidification in Canada. Um, but before I get going, I'd just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I'm speaking from today from Calgary, Alberta. Um, and this is the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Satina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. <clears throat> Um, so before I get going, I just am curious from the audience here um, to know a little bit about your background in, in ocean acidification. Um, so uh, I'm curious to know if you've heard, never heard of it, if you've maybe heard of it, but you're not very familiar, you've heard of the term in passing perhaps, um, maybe you know some of the basics of um, how it works, or perhaps you are either an expert on the topic or you work on the topic or you, um, it, you've done it through work um, at some point or through your research. Um, awesome, okay, cool. So it looks like most of you know the basics. Awesome, that's really great to understand. So yeah, I'll give you a little bit of an, an introduction and just kind of cater that to everyone's knowledge. Um, but it sounds like a few people have heard of it but are not very familiar. So that's great. Um, hopefully I'll be able to share some cool stuff with you today. Um, so yeah, ocean acidification, those of you that have heard of it and know some of the basics have probably heard of it called the other CO2 problem. So it's sort of the hidden side of carbon dioxide emissions. And what has happened over time is as our carbon dioxide emissions have increased, about 30% of those emissions actually get absorbed by seawater. And this creates a chemical reaction. And a couple of the end products are that we get an excess of hydrogen ions. And this excess of hydrogen ions at the end of this chemical reaction does a couple of things. First of all, it's what drives the pH of seawater down. So um, you can see here that as carbon dioxide increases, um, pH decreases. The other thing that it does is that hydrogen ions bond really readily with carbonate ions that are naturally found in seawater. And the issue there being that um, this is really important for shell building organisms. And so there's a lot of concerns about how vulnerable shell building organisms will be because those carbonate ions are building blocks. And if they're taken away um, and not available to them, it makes shell formation um, potentially more difficult. And so there's a lot of concern, particularly in Canada around um, these potentially vulnerable economic, uh, socioeconomic species. So things like oysters, anything that's um, commercially um, exploited. Uh, so for those of you that are not familiar with Canadian geography, I just threw up a map of Canada. Um, so you can see that Canada, we have a few unique challenges that we face in terms of ocean acidification. First is we're surrounded by these three connected ocean basins. So we've got the Pacific on the west side, the Arctic to the north, and then the Atlantic Ocean on the east side. And there's also a couple of um, important sea bodies or water bodies, um, including the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Labrador Sea that are important commercial shipping and fishing areas, particularly, yeah, for the East Coast. So now I just wanna share with you um, this video here. Um, this is made by Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So this is our federal department of fisheries and oceans. And it just walks through some of the unique challenges that we face in terms of ocean acidification in Canada. So I'll just play this video and it's captioned as well, but there should be sound. Just make sure. Since the Industrial Revolution, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have continued to increase from human activities. About a quarter of these emissions enter the oceans, which dissolve and react with water. This chemical reaction creates carbonic acid, which lowers the pH of the ocean, making it more acidic and reducing the availability of shell-building materials. This process is called ocean acidification, or OA for short. Worldwide, OA affects ecosystems and the communities that rely on the ocean for livelihoods. As atmospheric CO2 continues to increase, so will OA, especially in colder oceans. The effects of OA are felt by many marine organisms. 
Ocean acidification reduces how much carbonate ion is available for shell formation. It can also cause a range of biological effects. Some species may thrive in a more acidic environment, while others may adapt over time by changing their diets or moving to more favorable environments. Some populations may decline or disappear. When small species that form the basis of food webs are affected by OA, then the whole food web can be affected. Canada's cold oceans are vulnerable to the impacts of OA because gases such as CO2 are absorbed more easily in colder waters. OA is taking place in all three of Canada's oceans. There are conditions in each region which further contribute to OA. Seasonal upwelling or the mixing of deep and surface water in the Pacific increases OA. Increased ice melt from glaciers and decreasing sea ice from warming temperatures in the Arctic cause OA to happen more quickly in the Atlantic. OA is influenced by the flow from the Arctic, uptakes of large amounts of CO2 in the Labrador Sea caused by deep mixing, and a combination of surface freshwater inputs and low oxygen seawater at the bottom of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Fisheries and Oceans Canada scientists monitor and study changing ocean conditions such as ocean acidification and conduct research to understand its effects on Canada's fisheries and ecosystems. This contributes to increasing global knowledge on OA. To learn more about ocean acidification and the important... All right, I'm just going to stop this video here um, because this link is actually outdated. ...work DFO is doing, um, please visit... There we go. Uh, so yeah, I will pop my video back on too. Sorry, got too many things open this morning. Um, so I believe Hannah was going to share... Sorry, my mouse is going crazy on me this morning. Um, I've shared that link for you now. Perfect. I'm just trying to find my own video now. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Um, yeah, so just to recap a few things in that uh, video. Um, yeah, so some of the challenges that we face in Canada in terms of monitoring and grappling with OA is that, well, one, we have the largest coastline of any country in the world. So it's really a lot to manage and a lot to monitor. Um, two, as mentioned in the video, the vulnerable Arctic um, is a, of great concern. So there's a lot of um, increasing freshwater input from um, um, melting sea ice and melting glaciers. Um, there's also a lot of concerns in the Pacific in particular about um, what's happening to our shellfish species because we get seasonal uh, upwelling along the west coast of both Canada and the US and there's already been some mass die off events of shellfish and um, a lot of this is potentially attributed to ocean acidification. Uh, as well to we're just naturally vulnerable given our high latitude carbonates are more soluble in colder water so just naturally our carbonate saturation states are lower so our, naturally the waters are just a little bit more corrosive so OA can exacerbate that. Two because we have such a large coastline uh, we have a lot of vulnerable coastal communities uh, that are uh, you know, for example, are really dependent on aquaculture and fisheries. So uh, that's a concern um, that we try and monitor and um, are very aware of when building this community. Um, so for anybody who's seen me post online or has seen our social media accounts, you might have seen us refer ourselves to the meal part as the meal part ocean acidification community of practice. And MEOPAR is our funder. So we're part of this really large organization. It's called the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network. And it's part of this federally funded program called the Networks of Centers of Excellence in Canada. And so we are just one small piece of the puzzle. Um, we are part of the knowledge mobilization and the integration initiatives. And so there's actually several communities of practice within MEOPAR. And so the goals of these communities of practice are to connect in interdisciplinary groups that are focused on a common issue, uh, foster best practices uh, for knowledge transfer and collecting data. Uh, this is really important when you're thinking about community science initiatives. Um, carbonate chemistry uh, can be really difficult to collect the data for and it involves some dangerous chemicals. So um, it's something that we are trying to be aware of. 
Um, two, we also want to be able to identify national knowledge gaps and um, help prioritize areas of action for Canada and Canadian research. So our community of practice is pretty new. We were initiated in 2018. And so they brought on two co-leads, one from academic science and one from government science. Um, and then they formed an interdisciplinary steering committee who helps guide some of the actions um, in our activities. And then they hired a coordinator who is the daily boots on the ground facilitator. Um, and so I'm the second of the two uh, coordinators that we've had. So our overarching goals as a community of practice are to coordinate across sectors and disciplines to share expertise and data related to ocean acidification um, and really kind of try and forge, forge some of these connections and open these lines of communication uh, between different sectors. Uh, of course, we want to identify pressing needs for OA research and knowledge, particularly where it impacts Canadian livelihoods and ecosystems. Um, and we also wanna create a collaborative and supportive environment for groups affected by OA. So really fostering that sense of community and really making sure that we are trying to support the community as best as possible. So uh, we have specific terms of reference that we use to help kind of guide our activities and our goals on what we're working on. So our goals are to develop these linkages between end users and creators of OA data. So um, between researchers and aquaculture operators, for example, uh, we really wanna help develop best practices for research and data collection, including community science initiatives. Um, we're working on building some data sharing networks and standards. Um, and this is a, in large part with other organizations within Canada, as well as the international ocean acidification community. Um, we're also working on developing regional hubs for OA research activities because we recognize that, you know, we're a big country and not everyone like East and West Coast might not have the same concerns related to OA. So this has been a delayed a little bit due to COVID, but we do have some activities that we're working on. So stay tuned later in the spring, summer for some more announcements on that. Uh, and then finally, we're developing a list of ongoing OA research and infrastructure, which I'll mention in a little bit here. All right, so this is our leadership team. I just wanted to kind of show, uh, highlight these people who help contribute to our community of practice. Excuse me. Um, and just kind of give you a sense of how interdisciplinary our group is. So first I mentioned we have two co-leads that um, Neil Parr brought on. So we have Brent Else, who is an associate professor at the University of uh, Calgary, and he specializes in chemical oceanography and marine carbonate chemistry in the Arctic. Then we have Helen Gurney-Smith is our other co-lead. She's a research scientist in the biological effects section of um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, so DFO, our federal department. And she specializes in biological effects of and climate change on marine organisms and ecosystems. Um, so right now she's working on, in the Atlantic, um, working on scallops and oysters in the Atlantic, but she also has a lot of background and experience working on shellfish in Pacific regions. Then there's myself. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Calgary in Brent's lab. And my job is to be the coordinator for the community of practice. And my background is in paleoecology. Um, so I look at the effects of OA on predator prey interactions, particularly uh, through deep time. Um, and then our steering committee who helps sort of guide all of our activities. Uh, we have Piero Colosi, who is a professor at the University of Quebec. Um, and he specializes in marine invertebrate physiology, life history responses, and adaptation potential uh, in the context of global change. We have Kamiko Azuzo Scott, who is with DFO. Um, she's a research scientist at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Halifax. And she's also an adjunct at Dalhousie University. And she specializes in climate change and carbon cycles in the and ocean acidification in the North Atlantic as well as the Arctic. Then we have on the West Coast on um, British Columbia, we have Wiley Evans, who is with the Hakai Institute. Um, and he is the OA lab manager at the Hakai Institute. And he specializes in ocean chemistry. And he's a really important member of the international ocean monitoring efforts 
including um, looking at things in both British Columbia as well as the North Pacific in general. We then have uh, Denise Joy, who is uh, the manager of Ocean and Climate Change Science at DFO, and she co-leads the DFO and joint NOAA. So NOAA is the federal group in the US. Um, so she leads this you know, joint group between DFO and NOAA um, on the ocean acidification. So we have these two working groups that um, are dedicated to ocean acidification. Um, and then finally, we have Jim Russell, who is our shellfish expert, um, an industry expert. So uh, he is the executive director of the BC Shellfish Growers Association, and he's been a finfish biologist and uh, shellfish uh, farmer. He's been the director of aquaculture and the director of strategic seafood initiatives for the province of British Columbia. And then finally, I'll mention that just later this year, we added a student representative position to the steering committee to have that early career voice. Um, and so we added Patrick Duke, he was brought on and he's a PhD student at the University of Victoria on the West Coast um, with Roberta Hamm and Debbie Eanson. So he's part of Canada's marine carbon cohort and his specializations are in ocean acidification sensors as well as air sea carbon fluxes in the Arctic as well as the Northeast Pacific. And we do have a couple of open slots um, that we're hoping to fill in the steering committee to help round it out, especially in terms of social sciences. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that. Um, so I'll just mention really briefly, one of the first things that we did as a community of practice was to develop a website. And this is still our main resource. Um, this is where we want people to go if they wanna learn about ocean acidification in Canada. So oceanacidification.ca, it's where we um, try and funnel all of our traffic, but it's where we put all of our resources and communications and any material here. So it's a lot of work to develop a website um, and it's constantly changing and being improved. Um, but yeah, we've got lots of great resources um, that I'll share some of those with you. Um, one of the other first things that was done was to join the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange and form Team Canada. So this is a really great platform. Um, and it basically, it's a, uh, you can sign up for an account and um, it's a great way to kind of keep updated on the ocean acidification community. And um, we are the Canadian lead. So you'll see down here, I am the team lead. And so I'll post updates on all of our activities. I'll post questions. Um, and it's a great place to have discussions about concerns. People can ask questions and um, not only see what maybe their fellow Canadians are up to, but really tap into that international um, wealth of expertise. So there's lots of different teams on the OA Info Exchange and people from all over the world are on there. Um, so it's great to learn about, you can join teams based on region, you can join teams based on topic of interest. Um, so it's a really great resource and we encourage all of our um, members to join on to Team Canada so they can see all of our updates that we post. Um, there's also another group that we're involved with called Go On. It's the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And we are part of a North American regional hub. And so we act as the Canadian leads for this group. So this is between uh, Canada, the US and Mexico. And the uh, Go On's goals align really well with our goals. And so um, as a community of practice, so the things that we wanna do within this North American hub are, um, we wanna continue documenting and monitoring OA. So this is really important for the UN Ocean Decade um, monitoring efforts to get to our sustainable development goal indicators. Um, ocean acidification is included under 14.3 for the sustainable development goals. Um, we wanna be able to understand impacts of OA, particularly biological impacts as well. This allows us to help um, with capacity building and collaborations between the three countries. So, so far some outcomes of this go on North American regional hub include, as I mentioned, better collaborations between countries. So now we have this joint DFO, NOAA, um, ocean acidification working groups. Um, so there's two, there's a bio, uh, monitoring and um, there is a biological uh, REM group as well. 
Um, the other things that we have been focusing on, there's been a lot of great discussions about how to better monitor biological responses. And there's been some recent publications, collaborative publications that have come out as well. There's been some collaborative publications measuring ocean acidification in both in uh, North Pacific as well as the Arctic. So this is a really great group um, to be involved with. Uh, so now I'll just do a little poll. I'm just curious in the audience whether you had heard of the OA Information Exchange or go on before. So these are these larger international communities. So maybe you hadn't heard of either. Maybe you'd only heard of the OA Info Exchange. Maybe you've only heard of go on or maybe you've heard of both. Oh, interesting. Look. It looks like people hadn't heard of either. So yeah, if you're interested in learning more, particularly in your area, if you're learning, interested in learning more about um, these groups, I highly re recommend checking them out. Um, so uh, I think I had another poll here. There, yeah. <laughs> now my question is, um, how likely would you be to use the OA Information Exchange? Maybe if I've given you a little bit of a taste of it. Um, uh, so options are not very likely. I might look into it very likely, or perhaps you're already signed up. So it, it is a great, I will just, again, I'll plug that it is a really great resource and there's lots of teams depending on your region or your interest. Uh, there's been lots of great discussions, for example, on some of the shortages that we've faced in terms of uh, standard reference materials for seawater due to COVID. Um, so that's been a really important discussion. So it looks like people, yeah, might check it out. So I encourage everyone to do so. Perfect. All right. So a few other things I'll just mention. Um, when we started our community, it was a lot of invitations. So we asked our steering committee, who do you think would be interested? Can we send them an invitation to join our community? Um, so that a lot of it was word of mouth and us sending invitations to people and hoping that we could get the word out um, and encourage them to join our community. Um, the other thing that we did early on and that we continue to do is we started to develop uh, quarterly newsletters so that we can kind of help show that we're pushing new materials forward and allowing a space for people to ask questions as well. Um, so we continue to do those quarterly newsletters and the next one will be in June. Uh, we've also held a few past workshops and webinars related to OA in Canada. Um, so at the end of one of our MEOPAR annual scientific meetings, we held a workshop on ocean acidification in Canada, where we got to hear about OA monitoring assessment in the Arctic. Um, instrument development for new ocean acidification sensors, how to develop industry partnerships for OA research, as well as developing solutions for coastal uh, communities and stakeholders. So getting some tips from experts that have done this before. Um, there was another workshop that we held. One of our regional activities was the Baines Sound Environmental Intelligence Collaborative Workshop, which was held in British Columbia. And this was a really great opportunity for us to bring together. Uh, half the participants were industry members, uh, so aquaculture operators, and half were scientists. And the, the focus of this meeting and this workshop was um, addressing threats facing the shellfish industry in BC, particularly some of these summer mortality events that we've been seeing. And so um, basically scientists were able to do some knowledge sharing and knowledge transfer. So sharing knowledge about oceanographic patterns and current and future estimates of marine CO2 in British Columbia and known drivers of infectious disease and experimental work that's being done. So the, the latest experimental work that's being done on shellfish species uh, in terms of OA, uh, especially oysters. Um, and so this was a really great opportunity to help forge some of those connections and um, help knowledge with knowledge transfer to the people who really need it and are impacted by OA. We also have held a couple of webinars and we have plans to hold a few more. Um, we have created a new webinar webpage on our site, so you can go and browse all of our past webinar recordings. This one is really great. Um, this was done by Patrick Duke. It was a webinar on ocean acidification sensors. 
Um, so if you're wanting to do an OA project and you don't know where to start, because um, some of these sensors are very expensive, he'll kind of walk through some of the pros and cons of what you might need for your project. So if you're thinking about the length of the project, uh, fouling on your instruments, uh, sensor capabilities, accuracy and drift, um, as well as price points, um, this is a really great resource. So you can check it out on our website. We also just had a couple of weeks ago another webinar by a PhD candidate in at Dalhousie University in uh, Atlantic Canada. And she shared some of her dissertation research looking at carbon fluxes on the Scotian shelf, so off Atlantic Canada. And it was really great and really informative. Um, we also have a catalog of research and infrastructure that we developed, and this was sort of meant to be these accessible quick snapshots of projects so people could go and see what's being done, who's doing what where, and get an idea of the project, and then as well have uh, contact information for the people who are doing these projects. So if you are a member of the public and you want to learn more, um, the idea was that we'd be able to contact people. Um, so we've kind of morphed this a little bit and changed this catalog slightly, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, I just wanted to plug really quickly too, uh, we are not the only group within MEOPAR, um, the, the only ocean acidification group that is funded. So there's other research programs that are being funded through um, MEOPAR. And if you're interested in any of these projects, you can visit their website, meopar.ca and find out some more information about those. Um, and I'll put my contact information up too if people are curious to learn more about these projects, I can um, send you the uh, appropriate information. Um, but yeah. Uh, just wanted to plug that there's a lot of other OA research that's being funded by Neopar. All right, so I'm going to share some of our new activities that we're doing. This might be a little bit different. It's not as much of a science talk as maybe um, uh, some people are used to, but uh, I think this is if you're interested in science communication, if you're interested in community building and um, how to engage with the public, um, I'm hoping that some of these tools will be useful for you. Um, so as everyone knows, with COVID, we sort of um, have reshaped the way we do things and the way we do science and the way we communicate knowledge across the world. And when COVID hit, it was actually sort of the two year mark for the community of practice. So this was sort of a nice chance for us to pause and reflect of, okay, how can we actually engage more people? How can we continue to build our community of practice? Can we try some new things? And so some of these activities that I'm gonna discuss are us trying new ways to engage our members. And so the goals of this are hopefully to increase awareness and engagement of our community as well as ocean acidification. We hopefully are trying to grow our audience. Um, and then of course, our main goal is always to identify knowledge gaps in areas for knowledge mobilization um, to help kind of forward OA action for the benefit of Canadians. Um, so yeah, here's a few things that I'm just gonna be spending the rest of the talk um, talking about. And um, yeah, really, I think COVID was sort of a really interesting way for us to sort of embrace this new online world and try a few new things. So the first thing I'll mention is our map of Canada's ocean acidification resources. So this is how we've taken that catalog and sort of pivoted it. So it's still got all of our catalog items, but the, we've continued to add a lot more material. And this way it just allows us to um, keep it more up to date. And so it's constantly being um, updated and um, changing based on new material that we add. So the idea is that people can go on to this uh, resource map and look in their area, for example, and find all these th things that might be related to their interests. Um, we also have categories of uh, pins that we use. So they're based on projects, people, and research groups, excuse me, and um, to facilities and infrastructures. Um, so I'll share the link for that again at the end, but you can find that on our website. Um, and I'll just show you what this map looks like. 
So it's just made using Google My Maps because that's a tool that everyone is familiar with. It's an accessible free tool for people to use. So you can go on um, to this map and look at all the pins in different areas. And one thing you can do is you can, if you're looking at a particular topic, you can just select or unselect those because you'll notice in coastal areas, we have a lot of overlapping pins, um, which makes sense. Um, so yeah, for each pin, you can click on it and what it will do is it'll bring up the title of that pin and then there'll be a link. And that link is what allows us to stay, uh, it's basically a tag. So it allows us to keep all of the information updated on our website. So it'll take you to our website and it'll provide every single resource that we've accumulated for that particular topic. Um, the other thing too, is that we, you'll see with each pin, there's a huge list of keywords that we've typed in. And so this is to make the map searchable. So you can actually search through a topic. Like if you want to learn more about oysters, for example, you can search oysters and it'll bring up all the pins on the side here that mention oysters. Um, it also brings up some Google uh, oyster links, but sometimes that's not uh, always useful, but it, it might be um, depending on the topic. Um, yeah, so this is a great new tool and I, like I mentioned, we're trying to keep it updated as much as possible and if people have resources they want added to it, by all means, uh, contact me and I'll provide my information in a second here. Uh, one other thing that we're trying is a new blog series. So we actually have four new blog series that we are creating and the idea with this is to help create online content to help uh, build content to feed our map but also to make sure that we have a lot of um, accessible resources available, particularly for end users of ocean acidification um, information. So I'll just go through a couple of those. Um, so our first one we have is called OA News You Could Use. Um, this is a little news bulletin that I put out every Thursday morning. Um, and I include sort of some of the latest updates that have happened both in Canada, but also internationally in the OA world. So I like to include if there's upcoming webinars or events um, happening either in Canada or internationally, if we have new blog posts, new webinar recordings, if there's new resources, educational resources that a group has put out, I'll put those on there. Um, and I also always like to include um, a new research item. So if there's been a new paper that's come out, um, I'll put that on there. So I always include a new research paper um, as well as I always try and include a news item. So if there's been something particularly in the Canadian news that's related to OA, I'll put it on there. So the idea with this is that you can every Thursday morning, take your phone, spend five minutes, click through these titles if they interest to you or if they're of interest to you. And um, also hopefully one thing we hope with this is that it's a service that we provide but also we hope that it's a link to our website so that you can explore some of our other resources, click on our other news posts and see what, our, what else we're up to. Another one here, um, I'm giving you a sneak peek for one that's coming out next week. Um, one other blog series we do is called Scientist Spotlights. We do these about once a month and um, we, it's basically an informal Q&A where we interview researchers to get their background and their research interests in ocean acidification. Um, and we try and target early career researchers as much as possible because we want this to be a platform for them to showcase um, their knowledge and get their names out there. Uh, it has been really great to learn people's different perspectives about why they do ocean acidification research and what interests them. Um, so again, it's meant to be accessible content so everyone can enjoy it, whether you're a scientist or not. Um, but yeah, these have been really great and really interesting to learn about uh, people's motivations. There's another one we do that's similar. It's called Research Recaps. Again, we do these about once a month and it's a Q&A interview, but these are a little bit more targeted because we usually try and have it around a specific research item. So for example, if there's been a new paper that's come out, by someone who uh, did work in Canada, um, we'll interview them. And the idea is that it allows us to sort of peel back the curtain on how the scientific process works so that people can get an inside glimpse as to how research papers and research is actually conducted. So I always like to ask questions like, um, 
did you find anything unexpected along the way? Did you face any challenges? Were there things you weren't anticipating that happened that you found? Um, so it's really fun to learn about people's um, ocean acidification research um, that they're doing across the country as well. And again, I try and target early career researchers as much as possible because we want this to be, um, again, like I said, a platform for people um, to get their research out there. Finally, we all mentioned we do this other one called this Meet the COP, and this is very similar to our scientist spotlights, but it is specifically with our leadership team, so the, um, the co-leads and the steering committee. And um, the idea with this is that not only do you get a little bit of people's backgrounds and interest in ocean acidification, um, it's a chance for us to discuss some of the issues facing Canadians and the motivations for building this COP. So why do we exist? Why is the community of practice important to Canadians? And it's been really inspirational to understand um, people's motivations and why they think that the community of practice is so important that they would dedicate all of this time to helping um, us build this community of practice. And so you can see here, I did a little interview uh, with Brent. So we're trying to do some live interviews as well for this one. So stay tuned for more of those. Um, so yeah, these are just some more blog posts that we've done. Um, it's not necessarily just these four, those are our main ones, but we also can do custom pieces if people are interested. So I did one on a really cool collaborative project between some scientists at the Hakai Institute um, on their ocean acidification research that they're doing. Um, so yeah, these are also two, I'll just mention that um, we use a free program called Canva to make social media graphics. And that's been um, a really cool way to sort of learn about what people, what makes people interested in graphics and click on uh, posts. So if you wanna be featured or if you have an idea for a post, we're always looking for new content. So um, my, uh, my email address is coordinator at oceanacidification.ca. So I'd love to hear from people if you're interested in um, doing a piece for us or contributing in any way. Um, two, if you have items to add to our map, uh, I would love to hear from you. Just really briefly, I'll mention that we are doing some reorganizing of our website. So we're constantly, like I mentioned, we're constantly updating the website. We just added a new page, uh, as I mentioned about, um, with all of our past webinars. So you can check that out under our resources tab here. Um, we're always trying to update it and um, listen to feedback that we get. So if anyone has any suggestions of content they'd like to see, um, that's always great to hear. One other thing that we've been trying to do is we've actually been trying to translate our website into French for our French Canadian colleagues. Um, that's very much a work in progress, but we're working on it. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, like I said, our website is our main resource. So especially with COVID times, we're learning how important having those online resources is. So um, stay tuned for more updates. Uh, briefly, I just thought people might be interested in our membership. Um, and what it takes to kind of help build these communities and how you can uh, potentially look at your uh, community. Uh, I will mention that this, our stakeholder groups here, this is just by email affiliation. This is not a formal survey by any means, but you can kind of see uh, the breakdown is mostly government, academics and industry uh, folks, but we also have a large contribution from international ocean acidification groups. So a lot of people in the US and beyond. Uh, we do have quite a bit of people from NGOs in Canada and the US as well. Um, I always like to include students as a separate group just so we can have that early career voice um, represented. A lot of people from Neopar, uh, the organization as well. And we do have a lot of con Indigenous community leaders from both Canada and the US. And one other thing, important thing that we've done is that originally I said we had these uh, these memberships, we kind of just invited people that we thought would be interested in ocean acidification. And one thing we've done is we've added a form to our website where you can actually um, add yourself. Um, we created this new mailing list, new membership list. So it's oceanacidification.ca slash join dash us. And this has been really great because it's allowed us to capture people that maybe weren't necessarily on our radar. So we've actually had about 40, 45 people 
um, that have added themselves on their own that we didn't know about. So this is really great for us to help make sure that our community is as inclusive as possible. Briefly too, I'll mention um, social media. It's actually becoming an increasingly important tool, I think, especially for um, online content. Uh, so we've been trying really hard to increase our social media presence since, um, yeah, basically since um, October. And you'll notice here that our Facebook um, following has not really increased very much. We see very, very low engagement on Facebook. So it's not the most useful platform for us. Um, the interesting thing I find is that our Instagram following, you can see, has increased quite a bit since October. And we actually get the most engagement in terms of like people liking our posts and interacting with our content. But not a lot of people are actually um, driven to our website. Uh, and that might be a limitation of Instagram itself. It's a little bit more challenging to put the appropriate links in. There's a few more clicks. Um, so people might not do that. Um, but our Twitter following is definitely, it seems like Twitter is um, the most useful platform for us. We put all of our new blog posts, announcements on Twitter, and it's actually the third largest source of website traffic. Um, so that's really interesting. And I think it shows that, you know, Twitter is, can be a really useful platform if you're trying to increase awareness of your resources. So going forward, I'll just mention a few things that we're working on. So first of all, we have um, an OA sensor package that we are um, a project that we're trying to develop some partnerships with aquaculture industry uh, and aquaculture operators where basically we're hoping to deploy some sensor packages um, to help monitor ocean acidification in their area. But the goal with this is that we want to help um, individual operators be able to determine and predict when they might get really um, bad conditions for their animals potentially um, and uh, try and avoid maybe some of those mortality events. Um, and the other thing too that we're hoping, this is a kind of a, an ongoing developing project that we're still working on developing, but one of the goals here is that we wanna compare sensor performance. So a lot of the really well-established existing ocean acidification sensors are very expensive. So that can be really cost prohibitive, especially for individual operators. And there's a lot of newer sensors that are emerging that are cheaper. Um, so one of our goals is to hopefully pair an expensive existing sensor with some of the newer, cheaper sensors to see what performance is like. And if maybe those some of those cheaper, lower cost sensors might be uh, more accessible and less cost prohibitive for individual um, aquaculture operators. We're also working on some vulnerability assessments. Um, this will be at the, hopefully at the regional level. The goals here are to facilitate regional priorities and action plans. Um, and this very much is uh, from benefiting from DFO NOAA collaboration. So those working groups, this is one of the things that we're um, helping out with. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, some species might uh, cross borders so we can look at shared regions and common species of interest. And if you're interested in learning more about vulnerability assessments, um, the OA Alliance here, um, the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification um, has some recent webinar recordings that they did um, that are really informative if you want to learn more about how to conduct a vulnerability assessment. So briefly, I'll just mention some other things that we're working on is we're trying to invite new people um, as well and hoping people can add themselves. We're working on a database of resources, um, papers and projects that have been done um, as well as people. Uh, we've got some upcoming webinars and workshops that we're working on as well too. We're working on a, a white paper that's an overview of the state of OA knowledge in Canada. So hopefully that will come out in or be submitted, sorry, <laughs> in uh, a few months time here. And then of course, there's a lot of international ocean acidification groups that we try and keep um, collaborations with. So here's just a few of them, but um, you can see groups like the OA Information Exchange go on and the OA Alliance as well. And with that, um, I would just like to say thank you so much for your time and for listening. Thank you to our steering committee as well as our co-leads. And thank you to Hannah um, and everyone at MASTS for inviting me to speak today. And I just have one final question for you. Um, and that is, which of our resources most interested you? So was it maybe our resource map? 
our blog posts, uh, webinars or workshops, or maybe some of our upcoming planned projects. Um, and if you have others, feel free to um, share those as well. All right, so it looks like there's a little bit of a mix of webinars and workshops as well as some of our upcoming projects. Cool, awesome. So we'll, that just helps us kind of gauge what um, people might be more interested in and what uh, new content we can help create, um, especially research content. And with that, I will just put up our information if anyone um, has wants to learn more and I will take questions at this time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christina, for that really interesting talk. It's I see lots of things that uh, as a kind of community as well, masks can kind of learn from and see what you've been doing. And also there have been some very similar, uh, a lot of similarities, you know, having to be more present online because of the pandemic and change our tactics about certain things. And we're also, uh, you know, uh, undertaking a bit of a rebranding ourselves. Uh, so any mass members who are with us right now, you may have received an email about voting for our, what may be our new logo. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're all kind of doing this reshuffling at the same time, it seems. So I have a couple of questions myself. Um, I'm not sure if it got mentioned actually, but how many members do you actually have? Like, is, is that quite a kind of a hard number to pin down or is it, um, do you know, do, do you know actually how exactly who who is, classified as a member that's a great question yeah so um because it was originally just an email blast we didn't know exactly but we have about because this basically this new mailing list that we have has helped us mm. kind of track it also helps us track um we use mailchimp i'm not sure if people are familiar with that but you probably regularly get emails from different uh groups that use mailchimp as a platform and um it's really great because you can see engagement and you can see people subscribe and unsubscribe themselves. So it allows people to have more control. So there's about, I think we have about 190 people at this point. So, um, and then that grown quite a bit from originally, I think there was about 80 people that joined. So. Yeah. And how are you kind of reaching out to these new members? How are you saying, Oi, you join our mailing list and become a member because Obviously, there are going to potentially be lots of PhD students, uh, new early career researchers who are at institutions uh, or organizations that, you know, could really benefit from joining. Um, so how are you reaching out to them to join? That's a great question. Um, and it's actually been a big undertaking. But uh, basically, there's a couple of things I've been trying. So one, um, I've been, I have a bunch of metadata I've been collecting on anybody who's published anything related to ocean acidification in Canada. Um, I've been um, basically finding everybody's uh, names from the author list and trying to contact them and building a huge list of potential people um, to then also encouraging them if they have students um, to uh, have their students. The other thing I've been doing is actually just Googling. <laughs> So I have a list of about 300 people that I'm hoping to contact and I'm slowly mm -hmm. sending emails out. But yeah, like you said, trying to get the new people, the students is um, really something that we're trying to be aware of is like, how can we grab those people? So a lot of times it's like going to a PI's website and then seeing yeah. who their names are. Um, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doing a lot of groundwork I see right yes, now. Exactly. So, yeah, good effort. Um, and uh, out of interest, what, well, I guess because you're, uh, you know, you're still very much kind of uh, an initiative that's gathering members. What's been like the uptake for people doing these blogs? Because, you know, we have researchers who are very busy uh, doing their uh, doing their own work, potentially teaching as well. And, um, you know, how, how has the um, uptake of participating in your blog series been from members? Has it been quite positive? Have you kind of had to do a little bit of nudging here and there uh I'm just curious as to how how, how you're going about that you it's can see that I, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from your work <laughs> right now 
It's definitely a challenge, I think, particularly because of the pandemic, people are quite busy. So that's another reason why we try and target early career folks is because we figure they might be more willing to engage um, and they might be, have a little bit more time. And this might be, it, there might be more of an incentive, I suppose, um, because this allows them, you know, to have something that, great that they can put on their CV, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say maybe between 30 to 50 percent participation so basically it's I'll if someone publishes a new paper for example I'll send out and say hey we saw you publish this new paper we'd love to have you uh, contribute to our blog um, it really sometimes it does depend on people's schedules sometimes people say great can you give me two months um, so <laughs> sometimes it just depends um, yeah. but yeah we try and be flex as flexible as possible and originally I was hoping to have like a weekly thing that I could post out of some kind but I think people are just too busy for that right now so once a month for each of them so like once every other week is about I think a, a good schedule <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no that sounds good I was really interested in that there was a question submitted in the Q&A um, which I think actually might be better answered uh, maybe maybe you you feel comfortable Christina answering this but there may be actually an answer on your website about this uh, that helps answer this question that's come in um, they thank you for the presentation but their question actually relates to any idea about ocean acidification and microplastic pollution so um, that might be something that you want to answer or even point in a direction of somewhere where if they want to find out more, they can. Uh, yeah, microplastic pollution. Actually, I believe there, uh, I'm not sure if there's any connections necessarily between the two of them. I know, uh, I think there are some research groups, not specifically in Canada that are doing that, that connection there. But that's a really interesting question. Um, within Meopar, there are a few uh, microplastic, or maybe it's just one group, but there, uh, if you go check out meopar.ca, um, I believe there's at least one project that's being funded that's looking into some of these microplastic pollutions. Um, but that's definitely something that I think that people are, are interested in and thinking about, but um, not that I know of that's happening in Canada. Mm -hmm. And actually that kind of very <laughs> slightly relates to something that I also wanted to ask about when you mentioned that there were other ocean acidification projects funded by Meopar um, I wondered what the distinction was between them and you how how, mm. how that's different what makes uh, them and this this project that you've been speaking about today uh, separate entities uh, well basically I mean we, we share resources it's just they're independent of us so um the Meopar, we are funded through the community of practice. So we have like a set budget that, and that we follow. Um, but Meopar also has um, independent like PIs that can apply for funding through them. And so these are independent researchers at different ins uh, institutions, universities that have applied for funding um, and yeah, conducting separate research projects. So they have, there's postdoctoral projects as well that you get funded by Meopar. Um, so yeah, these, so oh, Meopar does, not only do they have these communities of practice and these groups that they fund, um, but then they have independent research projects that they fund as well. So, um, they're not necessarily related to our community of practice, but we certainly, um, we actually did a blog post on one of the, uh, papers that came out of one of the projects. So, um, and have been in contact with some of the other PIs and hopefully we'll be showcasing some of their work, um, in the future. Ah, <laughs> oh, that sounds great. So it really does sound like you are building up a little bit of a community that's all in the name as well, which is really nice to hear. And uh, this, this screen that you're sharing right now there, it links into how one become a membership. So if people are interested in that quarterly newsletter, um, mm -hmm. just, just type in that link uh, and then they'll be able to find out more and get informed in what you're up to. Cause I'm sure that there are some people on this call who may have colleagues in Canada uh, and stuff and uh, maybe they can even give them a polite nudge if they're not already <laughs> members as well and um, actually uh, with the link to the info exchange um, team sign up I, I wanted to check is it free for someone to do so like you don't have to be affiliated with a university or anything like that it's anyone can sign up with any email at all yeah and I believe you don't I think as a member of the public, even if you haven't signed up for an account, I believe there's some things that you're still able to see, 
But if you sign up for an account, yes, it's free. And um, yeah, you can join whatever teams you want and mm-hmm. um, just see some of the discussions that are happening. So particularly for groups like I mentioned that are concerned about getting those standard reference materials from um, Andrew Dixon's lab. Um, that's a, been a big concern for uh, with COVID. Um, those materials are hard to come by. So there's been a lot of great discussion on um, how to build secondary standards and that kind of thing. So it's it's a really great resource that I just recommend everyone check out and yeah, free to sign up. Yeah, excellent. Right, that very neatly brings us into the close of this webinar. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, so if anyone does have anything that they want to ask Christina directly, then uh, her email, her generic email that you can contact her with is on the screen right now. Alternatively, just follow them on social media if you want to keep up to date with everyone. Uh, there's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. And of course, you can sign up for the mailing list with uh, just the uh, web address that's shown at the top, the oceanacidification.ca. Um, thank you very much, Christina, for talking to us today. It's been super interesting uh, just listening how you've come from an idea to actually becoming something and um, really getting your members involved and out there and communicating across a very large country too (laughs) thank you very much for the invitation awesome thank you and thank you for everyone who is with us today I'm just going to quickly highlight uh what next week's talk is which so that was today Next week is, whoops, bit of a spoiler, uh, is from Marilena from the National Oceanography Centre. And she's speaking next Wednesday, as always, at one o'clock UK time. If you want to join this webinar, then just go to the MAS website, sign up like you did to join this webinar. And we've got these other talks that are happening at the end of May and the rest of June, which has speakers from the EMBRC program and uh, some of our rescheduled talks as well. So check that out. It's all on the MAS website under upcoming events, and we hope you can join us again soon.